if I came here and told you, yeah, of course, uh, we would just went all over the market and said, well, you know, forget about the samples. We're going to go digital. And everybody said, yeah, great. Awesome. Let's go ahead and do it. That would be a lot. Um, I can tell you this funny anecdote. When I went to Malmo, actually, in Sweden, the first training we've ever done on this digital showroom setup we have. Um, and a colleague and I, we brought a touchscreen, you know, to do the training and so on. And I'll never forget the, the face of one of the sales reps and she was like, what on earth is this alien you bring to my show, right? What is this big touch screen, right? And of course, you always get the question, ah, you blame to replace us. I mean, if you go sample free, why would they come to the show? <laughs> Good question. Yeah, I mean, the first answer to that is that, as I said before, you can take away all the samples, but you can't take away the knowledge of the sales reps. So they will know surely what, what works for them. And of course, this is something that we're working on right now. As I said, we're still in the transition phase. So we do still have samples in the show. I don't think that a customer who's been in the industry for 30 years comes in, throw away the samples. Now you have to put in this fancy goggles on and just stay with them for, I don't know, a couple of hours. I will get dizzy, let alone somebody who has been doing that for many, many years, right? And they said, yeah, but hold on a second. But then, how do we do cafe or cake? You know, like that's what the Danish do, right? They just have coffee and cake at the beginning. How's it going? How's your family? How's your kids? And these things, right? Whereas I remember I went to a, a customer meeting in the UK. I love the sales rep there. She's amazing. And I kid you not, in 30 minutes, it was over with. Like fast forward, going through the whole collection, half an hour, that was it. Yeah, see you, take care and see you next time. Bye. Uh, one of her just happened. And I think that what will be amazing is that as you're ordering through, uh, going through the order, then to have that AI to actually tell you, yes, you're going towards this right direction. And I think that now, just have in mind that you have a gap here on the t-shirts because they sold out very well, last, last drop, last collection. So you need to focus on those as well. And he stopped me and he said, Luca, yeah, but you're explaining it too technical. They're not gonna understand it. Like, all right, gotcha. And then actually flipping it into the sales way of talking. Then that was like a huge eye opener for me. And that's how we've been doing the trainings ever since. Although we know that we have some markets that they need a bit more complexity when they're creating the outfits. So we can add this. For instance, I can choose this t-shirt. I can choose this pant. And now I can also add this cardigan which will be layered on top of the t-shirt in the outfit. I mean, that, that technically is yeah. a challenge. But how about starting with um, presenting who Luca is and what you do at Name It? Yeah, well, uh, I'm 30 years old and I come from Italy. Um, yeah, I ended up actually in Denmark for five years. And the simple reason for that is that my girlfriend is Danish and we met in Canada of all places. So it's a, it's a whole messy story, uh, which would take me like three years to explain. Like, I think I should sell it to Netflix at some point. It's crazy. But um, ironically, I was there through an internship for my master's uh, working with what in Italy you would call like a consortium, like a network of kids were fashion companies. And I just happened to meet her. And then after flying back and forth, we wanted to kind of close the gap. So I moved over to Denmark. I wanted to make a, uh, an abroad experience anyways. So that fitted the bill very well. Um, and I started to work in a company called iPaper as a, you know, the sales rep. Uh, wonderful company to like get your, let's say, starting point into the, the industry, into the digital industry. And then I always wanted to join a large organization in Denmark, like bestseller. And then when I saw the opportunity, name it to join as the country product and sales responsible for the Italian market. I thought that was perfect fit. So I jumped immediately at the opportunity and I felt like entering a family and it still very much feels like it to this day. Um, and of course I realized quite early on that we had a very good drive when it comes to the digital part of it. And then I moved, I think after a little less than a year, I moved to the digital team and that's where I've been for the last three uh, years now. So, uh, yeah. And now we just, you know, keep pushing the digital agenda forward. Awesome. But you did, so your first assignment and name it was more sales oriented. Absolutely. So, so meeting with customers as well. Um, not necessarily meeting with customers. So essentially what I was doing is like the, the link between the sales manager and the sales team in Italy. 
I was the connecting point in the headquarters in Denmark. Because of course, uh, as a streamline, at least for us, we get all the product design, information, inputs, all the rest of it from the headquarters, and then you need to feed it into the market. And then they will give you back the feedback. Uh, it's okay, this is the direction we want to go. We would like to go with this t-shirt, right, with this program and so on and so forth. Um, so obviously, I would be like the first filter because, of course, then you're able to skim out, okay, this stuff is not really going to work for us. For instance, if you take away the northern part of Italy, then we're not really that focused on selling uh, like um, clothing for skiing uh, in the south of Italy. So if we're doing something, then, of course, you have to take that into account. Um, whereas... We like a lot of the uh, unbrushed sweatpants, for instance, whereas in the Nordics, they love brushed because obviously the temperature is very different. So I was there doing this sort of pre-filtering options and then, of course, handing it over to the, uh, the team in Italy. And they are the experts. You know, they know the customers well. They know the market perfectly fine. I know that there is a, an ambition to be able to... Uh go sample less yeah so yeah. Some, uh, that would be very interesting because i've talked to a lot of fashion brands over the years and uh, very few people actually dare to make that statement mm -hmm. out of many reasons so it, it would be interesting to just hear how come uh, name it has that ambition where does it come from how well mm -hmm. is it fit? so so yeah i mean anything really on that topic yeah well, certainly one of the biggest drivers of that is sustainability. Um, not only name it, but as a bestseller as a whole, we've always been very focused on, on this aspect, which is key. Um, so, of course, if you want to go sustainable, then samples is probably the first place you want to look into. Um, and, you know, we, we tend to produce or produce design 10,000 new styles every year. Of course, we have some that we just that are high performing, so of course we keep them. But you always need to follow trends. In fashion, there's always new trends you need to grasp, stuff that you need to be on the lookout for. In order to do this, you need to try and explore different styles, different fabrics, different fittings, and so on and so forth. So certainly sustainability is one of them. But then, and surely, when you are cutting samples, then also the economic part is, is a key factor on it. But also commercially, like if we look into when you're selling uh, the collection and we take away all the digital tools, the technology that we use right now, which is go back a couple of years from now. So we sell them traditionally. So we only have the physical samples. We're not really sampling every single style in what we call the style family, if you will. So we might have the t-shirt in one color variant, and then we have the pant in the second color variant. But then the sweatshirt, the sweatpant, and the cardigan, we don't have any samples for it. So if I'm trying to sell to you, you might even say, okay, I like the t-shirt color variant number one. So now you have to imagine the pant in the color variant number one. And then let's say you can do it. You know, I have the physical sample. You just have to imagine a little bit. But then you need to imagine the, the three other styles that you don't have anything to work on. So what are you, as the customer, going to end up doing? You're only going to buy what you're seeing, so the T-shirt and the pant. So we're missing out on turnover. But the customer is actually missing out on the ability to actually sell the entire set okay. to his own customers. And that's a lot missed turnover and opportunities for them. Um, so that also is like incredibly useful to have this digital uh, way of selling where we can with just a few clicks we have the ability to see not only the five styles but as you said compare them with perhaps another theme you know because maybe we have the theme with rainbows and then we might have the theme with butterflies whatever the case might be and then the customer can see okay i think that this one will look much better in my shop because i can already visualize okay i'm going to put it this way in that corner over there because it fits very well with this and the other thing um, as opposed to just having to imagine yeah. So, so you're saying like going sample free selling is actually both sustainably more reasonable, mm -hmm. um, economically because you don't have to produce. That would also be and, fun. And ship. ship. Yeah, exactly. Shipping and handling. The time, I guess, also for sales reps to deal with. Absolutely. And then you're finally saying maybe there are more stuff, but you also said that um, by going sample free, you set up for a digital. Uh, path, I guess, where you can actually mm -hmm. enhance the ability for the customers to imagine, because they don't have to imagine anymore, the various yeah. combinations of products that, that can create an outfit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And also like just the time spent on it, you know, you mentioned it is actually a very key factor because of course, if you think of one sales rep in a showroom, then when a collection period is over, you need to take down the collection, pack it away, and then you need to unpack 
the other collection sample is arrived, they need to put it up nicely. However, as we all know, logistics is uh, a very complex machine and sometimes you can have delays. So even before selling, let's say we're doing a collection meeting and we're taking a look at the selection that we want to do for, let's say, Spain. If you don't have all the samples and you have no way to see all the other styles besides, I don't know, printed um, overview, then you don't have the entire scheme of your whole selection. You might miss out on styles that actually could be very well for your market and for your customers. And then it's just a domino effect going forward. Um, but the, okay, let, let's talk a little bit about the process because that's quite interesting as well, the, the transition and how you imagine the transition happening when you go sampleless. Yeah. Obviously, already today, there is limitations in the showrooms. I've seen some of your showrooms, they're big. There's also some that are very, very small. Yeah. Um, and um, it's obvious that you cannot feature like a, a lot of the samples in some of these showrooms. But, but then, you know, you have, uh, maybe you can have a touch upon salespeople or, or concerns rather with this type of strategy. So, so how do you think about showrooms? What, what, what do salespeople uh -huh. think about going sample less? What do you think customers are thinking about it? How do you imagine to mitigate? Because now mm -hmm. it's all be digital one way or another, right? So yeah. as digital responsible, how do you imagine doing this transition? Because if I didn't mishear you, you said 2026, that's not many years away. If I came here and told you, yeah, of course, uh, we would just went all over the market and said, well, you know, forget about the samples. We're going to go digital. And everybody said, yeah, great. Awesome. Let's go ahead and do it. That would be a lie. Um, I can tell you this funny anecdote when I went to Malmo, actually, in, in Sweden, the first training we've ever done on this digital showroom setup we have. Um, and a colleague and I, we brought a touch screen, you know, to do the training and so on. And I'll never forget the, the face of one of the sales reps. And she was like, what on earth is this alien that you bring into my showroom, right? Yeah. What is this big touch screen, right? And of course, you always get the question, ah, you're playing to replace us. Yeah. No, that's not going to happen because you like, we're trying to digitalize the way of selling, but the knowledge of the sales rep always will be a key ingredient to actually generate the correct sell, uh, let's say, process to the customer to di direct them into buying what they actually will sell right throughout their shops, uh, because that's a key factor. But essentially, what you need to do is to try little by little and get some success stories. And this is what we do. Well, that's what we did. We we started out with three markets, so the Dhaka region at the beginning, and just tested out not the whole collection, just little subsets, you know, things that we were already cutting down on organically. Because as I said, if it's something that you're already selling, the customers know the fabrics, they know the fit, they just change the color. You don't really need to sample it all and all the time, right? And we got some very great uh, success stories in doing that. So that gave us also the confidence to, okay, now we have proven this can work. It not only worked just for the, for the fact that you just substitute the physical sample into the digital one, but actually generates value, generates turnover, and also makes it more efficient. And from there, we just started to think, okay, which are, are the markets that right now are ready to make that switch? And then we just started to essentially go visit the markets because we try to do some online meetings. And as you well know, when you do online meetings, yes, of course you can pass the message across, but it's another thing to actually, especially when you're talking in English, you know, that, you know, might not be your, uh, your mother tongue. You might not be that comfortable in asking the question. It's something new. You've always been selling with uh, physical samples. You're not that comfortable in asking the question that may sound stupid at the beginning. Whereas if we are there physically, I can read your body language. I can see if you actually have a question, you're not that inclined to say it. So I can, you know, kind of like, quote unquote, poke you in trying, you know, to get that question. Um, and then the other key is that when you're there, if you make the sales rep comfortable in making that switch, meaning put them into a, a simulated uh, situation where they need to create the presentation of all the different styles digitally instead of doing it with the samples. And then I would act as a sales rep. And thankfully, with my experience with the Italian team, I kind of know the language they're talking into. Is this another key? Instead of going there and, and be like, drag and drop, put it into this grid. No, no, no. Move the style next to this other set because then it will make the outfit nice. And I said exactly the same. I just translated into their language of the sales reps. But and, that's a very strong uh, selling point from, from uh, uh, the capability of the digital 
person, like digital responsible in your case, to actually have that insight, that know-how of how sales reps uh, benefit of using digital technology. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of times they're very siloed, right? Like the digital department doesn't really know exactly how sales yeah. reps work, which don't really know how the other teams work and so on. So I think that's a very key factor that I've seen uh, uh, you guys are are ex doing excellently. Yeah, I mean, it's also a factor of of trust that we build with the with the sales reps in the market, you know, because of course, why would they even listen to me in terms of, yeah, you've worked like this for 25 years now because I'm here and tell you that now you're going to have to use this technology. Why? Because it's fun. No, you need to build that, you know, trust between you and them just so that when they have a challenge, they will come forward to you instead of just, okay, what am I going to do now when I have the customer next to me? Can, can you that give an example huge. of can you, could you give of how you, uh, I mean, yes, how you build that trust, basically, well, what happens yeah. and yeah, what increases it? Yeah, so essentially what, what you need to do is that you need to kind of like empathize with them and not like when you go down there and you just say, well, you know, now you're going to have to sell this way. No, no, no. You need to kind of tell them, I know this is hard and I'm here to help you out. Let's do it step by step and I'm not going to leave this meeting until I fully understand and feel that you're comfortable with it. So let's mm. make some increasingly hard exercises. So let's start with building up the collection digitally as opposed to physically. From there, I will maybe ask you, okay, let's do some changes because of course you want to do a selection for the, for the market, but then each and every single customer is changing. It's different. As we said at the beginning, it depends. It's the key, the key word here. So you want to address that also with the way you present your collection digitally. Let's do it with as if I'm the customer, you know, try to mimic it as, a, as if I am the customer so that you feel a little bit comfortable in it. And at the end, sell to me. I will come and ask you questions. I will come and ask you, can I see the sample? And I promise you, eight out of 10 sales are, they just turn around. Oh, here's the sample, you know, which is totally fine. Absolutely fine. But, you know, then you just make a joke out of it. It's like, ah, ah, ah. You see, you should stay digital. You make a laugh about it and they feel more comfortable. You take down that barrier of, oh my God, I only need to do this. No, no, no. It's a process. I'm not telling you to go from zero to a hundred, like from one day to the other. It's a process that you need to go through and then you can take it at your own pace. And I'll be there to support you. If I'm not mistaken, I think, I, I think I've heard that um, the, the uh, management, the leadership of uh, Name and mm -hmm. also really commits and believes. Oh, absolutely. Direction, right? So, so um, I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I don't know if, if uh, the word of threatening is correct, but I think there's been a very, um, very clear signals to the organization that you better go digital, uh -huh. you better learn yeah. how to work with new uh, ways, basically, right? So that. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Threatening is not the, the right word for sure. It's more of a like, we've decided to make this decision and it's not that we did it, you know, for one day to the other. We tested it out and we could see the, the value of it. So we are going to implement this way of working, not only in terms of the selling part to the customers, but also internally. So the step before when we were deciding, okay, we're going to take in these styles, we're not going to select these styles. Now, this digital way of selling, this digital showroom platform is so much involved in our system that we had markets that, as you know, some of them are more keen on get, jumping into the boat, others are more reluctant, which is totally fine. But now, since the majority of the markets have started using digital showroom that much, then the markets that were a little bit lacking behind because they didn't want to, they didn't have the commitment or whatever the case might be, they started to see the potential. They started to kind of like feel left out. I had a market being like, yeah, but you know, now we're not getting the printed material because now it's only digital, but we're not there yet. So again, that's that's why you should jump in, shouldn't you? Yeah. Ah, yeah, maybe actually, maybe we should. And here we are, right? So it's a, it, it's a huge support and it makes things fundamentally easier to have like the management team really committed to this decision because of course, when we need some, uh, some help, some push, if you say, from, uh, from the management team, then everybody's very happy to give it. But most importantly, giving the why. Because really? it's a thing to impose something to you, but it's not a thing to give you a why. And if you give them a big enough why, then the change happens. And then, of course, little by little, then they will start to see the value. H 
how, how do you imagine the showroom experience to be? Because right now, I believe uh, for Name It, you have eight, uh, four big collections, eight smaller collections a year, something like that? Uh, no, exactly six uh, collections, so three per season. I would say uh, two and two split with two big ones per each season. One, it's a little bit smaller one, um, but that's how it is. Yeah, and, and it's quite common that you do get customer visits to the showroom for... for yeah. Well, yeah, and um, I mean, if you go sample free, why would they come to the show? <laughs> Good question. Yeah, I mean, the first answer to that is that, as I said before, you can take away all the samples, but you can't take away the knowledge of the sales reps. So mm -hmm. they will know surely what, what works for them. And of course, this is something that we're working on right now. As I said, we're still in the transition phase, so we do still have samples in the show. But of course... We're also trying to listen to the sales rep and listen to the customers. What is it that they need for us to remove those samples? Because of course, as you said, we have different showrooms. Not all showrooms are exactly the same size. We have some that are very large, others that are very small, and we need to find something that is scalable, you know, so that can work for the small showroom and for the bigger showrooms. But I think that what we're going to do, I don't have the answer right now. I mean, of course we are looking into it. I can't really disclose it. Um, but what I can say is that surely it's the whole experience, the, the giving you the inspiration of the collection, because it's a thing to just come down and, you know, see like on a big screen, all the different styles yep. and there will not be an added value. The added value is that the whole theme of the collection, the whole theme of this particular capsule, because at the end of the day, is that what the customers are going to buy into? Because is that what they're going to sell to their customers in their shop? Yep. And there's multiple ways that we can do this and we can see that technology is really ramping up at an incredibly surprising speed, which is very exciting to see. Um, and I think that the key hurdle right now is actually to differentiate from a technology that looks cool and a technology that actually helps and works. What I mean by that is that you can look into different technologies, you know, that are really great forward looking and all these sort of things. But then at the end of the day, they, they're more of a gimmick rather than actually a help for the sales rep and the customer. Yeah. And that's actually what, what you need to do to actually develop and deliver the yeah. good digital showroom experience of the future. And, I mean, I have to ask, obviously this week, the uh, spatial computing revolution started with the uh, Apple Vision Pro release. Is that something... Uh, I mean, what's your thoughts, first and foremost, in uh, yeah, that technology applied to the showroom experience? Um, um, how do you imagine? Um, yeah, uh, to be honest, right now, I think it, as incredibly, amazingly exciting it is, I don't think that right now that would be the right way to go. For the simple reason that we also have to cater at the demographics of our customer base. You know, some of them are very young and others are more experienced, right? So I think that, as I said, we need to draw a line. So, and we need to make it standardized. And I don't think that a customer who's been in the industry for 30 years comes in, throw away the samples. Now you have to put in this fancy goggles on yeah. and just stay with them for, I don't know, a couple of hours. I will get dizzy, let alone somebody who has been doing that for many, many years, right? So right now, I don't think, at least in this, right, this moment in time, I don't think that would be the right way to go. Um, but I would rather, you know, for instance, tap into other options like we touched upon the virtual try on. That's something that we uh, looked into um, yep. and we're just waiting for the right technology to help us out with that. But also yep. just the AI can just really, without going to that extreme, yep. um, really help us out in that sense. Exactly. But it, it is, um, I mean, maybe one should not rule it out too fast. It, it's quite interesting if you don't get dizzy, right? Like if, if you can mm -hmm. get this AR experience uh, and have things overlaid and yeah. it looks like on the commercials, but it always looks much better in commercials. We know that. Um, it would be an uh, interesting uh, uh, thing to evaluate. To, to, to Basically, what, what I really like about going into a showroom is that you really get that premium feeling of the brand, mm -hmm. of the capsule, and you get a sense of it. Um, I mean, you know, maybe you can try to achieve that with, with screens or other type of well. Um, but you said you're working on something, but you cannot disclose it right now. That sounds interesting. Yeah. When do you think <laughs> there will be a time for disclosing that? Well, let's say we're a bit closer to it. 
let's put it this way. Uh, but yeah, it's still like in the research phase, there's lots of amazing and exciting opportunities out there. Um, and yeah, I mean, I agree with you that you should have like that really amazing immersive experience. Yeah. Again, I think though, it's the right tool to do it for the demographics that we're into. Yeah. And that's the thing that for me is one of the biggest concerns that I have, um, you know, into finding a solution that caters for everybody. Yeah. Um, and, and also stepping into even more details, also like the different cultural ways of actually buying into the collection are fundamentally different from the Nordics compared to the Southern European markets. Yeah. So that's also something to, to take into account. I mean, that's actually a quite interesting topic. Yeah. So, uh, uh, the difference between the cultures and, and in your case, you actually visited and trained a lot of mm -hmm. uh, people, um, you worked as sales yourself. Why do you think there's such a difference? Why is this, it depends so big. I mean, in the end it's close for <laughs> humans, for kids, right? <laughs> Yeah. Like, like, well, what, what is it? I mean, what are the key factors that really make it so hard to grasp the process of selling? Um, I mean, I imagine sometimes if I would be like almighty, all knowing, and just, you know, be a fly on the wall in the sales meeting, <laughs> if I just are in, in enough of the sales meetings, I would figure it out. Uh, or is it really that different? It really is that different and actually what makes it so amazingly beautiful to work in and it's very exciting because for instance, this is going to make you laugh, but I remember uh, when we were training the Danish team and um, we said, you know, uh, this, this new way of selling will like help him be more efficient and therefore you will spend less time in serving the customers because of course you don't have to go through multiple different racks to see okay how much am i buying into so do i still have a budget for it you can just click two buttons and then you have the entire schematics of your budget and different product line categories and so on and they said yeah but hold on a second but then how do we do cafe okay you know like that's what the danish do right they just have coffee and cake at the beginning how's it going how's your family how are your kids and these sort of things right whereas yeah. I remember I went to a, a customer meeting in the UK. I love the sales rep there. She's amazing. And I kid you not, in 30 minutes, it was over with. Like, <laughs> fast forward, going through the whole collection, half an hour, that was it. Yeah, see you, take care, and see you next time. Bye. Uh, what on earth just happened? But it all made sense. Yeah. So you have the UK taking probably half an hour to serve a customer, whereas in, in Denmark, it might take a, a morning just because you need to take it at a slower pace. Yeah. And you're selling exactly the same kind of like range of styles, of course, with different selections, but the, you know, the bottom line is the same and it's crazy. I, I mean, is it because, uh, in, in UK, they don't have as much time or they are simply not interested in being friendly? Um, um, no, I think it's more the first one, really. Uh, they were super friendly and super nice as always. Um, it's just very much more on the fly. Uh, I'm also thinking about just the Italian market, you know. Uh, I haven't seen that many customer meetings, but they can really change from, I don't know, uh, even in the same region, it can change from one customer to another just because yeah. of their age, just because their way of working. And also, you yeah. know, if you have a small shop, then you have one kind of customer meeting. If you have a larger shop, then you have another one. Right. Yeah. So that's also something you need to take into account. Um, if you're selling to one of those large organizations uh, like cross-border onlineers, then they have much more structured customer meeting. It could take up to a couple of days as well. Whereas yeah. if you're in the same showroom, sales, sales, or you're selling to a customer that has a very corner shop, a very small shop at the corner of a street in a small town, yeah. it's a different uh, sales meeting as well. To what extent uh, do you think the experience of the sales person matters? In the end, I mean, someone that's spent um, uh, many years knows their customers versus someone that you know just got the job and their first set of uh, meetings. Like, what are the main key differences uh, in the way they handle themselves and they, they handle their customers? Well, it's exactly because we all go back to that. It depends. It depends on the customer, and you gotta know that customer that you're talking to, and not only the customer as the shop. You need to know the customer as in the buyer you're selling yeah. it to. 
So one of the keys of the, our digital showroom success is that we're able to personalize it to each and every single customer. So if I know that you, for instance, hate the green color, I'm going to change all of the styles and remove the green barrier and show, for example, the blue one because I know that you love it, right? Mm -hmm. If I know that in the back of my head, then I already can pre-prepare myself into guiding you towards that part of the collection that fits your needs better. Mm -hmm. Conversely, if I actually know that you're going to buy a lot into this kind of like, I don't know, a tech mm -hmm. outerwear because I know that you're going to be selling to a lot of these uh, skiers, for instance, that that's what I'm going to be focusing on because I know that that's what you're going to be really, really interested. In. And from there, try to upsell with other categories that maybe you're not that inclined to buy, but because I think it can fit with your shop. Yeah. That's an experience that's invaluable. You, you can't really get away from that. You can, you can train the, any artificial intelligence, in my opinion, to the best of its abilities, but to have that personal connection with that buyer or buyers, yeah. You, you, can't, you can't start to do it because, again, like I try to build the trust in the sales rep, they also build the trust with the customers. And, you know, there's no technology that will be able to take away that human interaction. I mean, I, I guess um, the human touch here uh, and the trust and that they would build with customers are really hard to trump. And um, mm -hmm. uh, it sometimes feels like uh, the uh, first level of uh, AI technology uh, would be to actually support the salespeople yeah. to remember, to, to be aware of, uh, of what actually just happened during the meeting or to be almost like a sidekick, an assistant that yes. can help uh, inform, yeah, keep them um, reminded about certain things about this particular customer or their business uh, that would be very interesting to see like what how could we apply ai uh to, to the extent where salespeople would be you know just enhanced yeah i mean i think that what you explained there is precisely the direction that i think is going to go and that's where it's going to be at the beginning um, the most efficient part so essentially guiding the sales reps into making the right decisions because of course um, you want to make sure that the sales rep, that the customers, they get, you know, the styles that are going to perform the best out of their stores, right? And you can look at it from different perspective. Of course, you have your knowledge as we just talked about, but also like having some sales data that's, you know, already, um, how do you say, nicely organized for sales rep. Because of course, you got to give them a lot of information in a nice and digestible way very, very quickly because they have a lot of things on their plate and don't have that much time to look into many different uh, data sheets. So if we're able to make it very easy to digest, I think you should push that kind of style or that kind of category as opposed to this one, because we can see that it's going to perform very well out of store with this particular customer. Yeah. Then that would be like having superpowers and it'll be much more spot on. And, you know, of course, when you sell to customers, things that, at the end of the spectrum, are going to sell out of their store very well. They will be much more inclined to come back to us and exactly. learn from and, and buy from us. I mean, obviously, you don't want to present necessarily only statistics, as you said, but more mm -hmm. insights. But like based yeah. on statistics, what are the key yeah. takeaways that you should now be aware of before or during the meeting, so you can, uh, you know, make better suggestions or have a better conversation with the customer? Yeah. Is there, I, I don't know if you have any top of mind, like, like what type of insights do they usually prepare up front mm -hmm. at the customer meeting? Do you have an example? Yeah so, no, yeah, so normally what they look into is like, okay, so we're in the collection, let's say two, right? So let's have a look at what you bought into last year's collection too. And then you might have, okay, in this product line, you bought this many jeans, you bought this many t-shirts, you bought this many sweats. How was the performance of the stores? Well, you know, we didn't sell that many denims, but we actually sold out the middle of t-shirts and sweatshirts. Okay, then we should buy a bit more than what we did last year in, the, in those categories and maybe take away some quantities from the denims into something else, you yeah. know, or just say, well, you know, we didn't really sell those denims because this fit wasn't perhaps the good fit for your uh, local market, whereas we should instead go for this one instead. So normally that's what they're looking into. Yeah. Um, and I think that what would be amazing is that as you're ordering through or going through the order, then to have that AI 
to actually tell you, yes, you're going towards this right direction. And I think that now just have in mind that you have a gap here on the t-shirts because they sold out very well, yep. last, last drop, last collection. So you need to focus on those as well. Furthermore, we can take it an extra step and go into product recommendations. So we said you really sold out very well this t-shirt. We actually believe that based on your purchase behavior and uh, you know your history in, in our purchase with us, that you should also attach and complete the look with this accessory because we can see that in your market is selling very well. Or you should add this, I don't know, denim because it fits very well with this sort of detail you have on a t-shirt or whatever the case might be, which is something that obviously the sales rep can do. But as I said, they have a lot of customers coming in. The collection is wide and you may forget it. And the AI can be there to, hey, remember to mention this and you can have additional to an order. I mean, these were really nice examples. Uh, do you think the AI will talk to them? <laughs> um, I don't think I don't think it will be like a talking as in like voice manner, but surely in terms of like images, you know, in the case it's like, hey, yeah, exactly. You know, like you're scrolling through the different collections, uh, the different styles, and you're like, hey, you know, have a look at this T-shirt. You know, <laughs> you mean we have to make a robot? <laughs> hey, look at this. You know, like. Check that one. No, okay. but I mean, uh, surely like some visual you know, ident um, indication for sure. Well, I, I mean, you, you said uh, in the beginning, like when you introduced the touch screen, the big touch screens uh, in mm -hmm. the showroom, that they, they say alien or monsters. What, what was the? <laughs> yeah, they were like, what is this alien you're bringing? Oh my gosh, it was such uh, a funny scene. And and, and now you said like, yeah, and this alien can now speak. I mean, how do you think that, <laughs> <laughs> how would they react? Um, you know, of course, the, the first big jump you need to make is to actually get them into the, the transition point that we're going from the traditional way of selling to the digital one. And I, in my experience with the sales rep that we have in the markets, and I've been tremendously lucky because all of them have really been embracing this. Of course, at the beginning, you're a bit more scared, right. but after you're comfortable with it, I have to say like it makes my job and my team's job much easier because they're very welcoming the new, the new technologies and they're giving us feedback. So. Right. I feel that right now we're at a point where, okay, well, this is cool, but can we get this as well? Yeah, it would yeah. be nice if we could have this sort of widget here with a star that allows us to know that this is a top selling style. So it's actually coming from them as well. Yeah. So that's what makes me very much calm going forward. Of course, we need to make sure that those markets that are a little bit behind in terms of the, ad the adoption of this new tool get up to speed. But I would say that right now we're in a very good place and surely the sales rep are like coming with the inputs right now that they're just waiting for it. Just out of curiosity, because you mentioned it now, why are those, I mean, when you have so many success stories and cases, mm -hmm. why are there still markets that are behind not adopting it? Um, um, yeah, I think it all goes down again to that kind of like, we've always been doing like this kind of market and, you know, it's sometimes it's easier to shift other markets and uh, other way around. Sometimes you have markets where, for instance, Italy, I'm Italian myself, and I know that we're very traditional in our country, in our way of being. And I thought, oh my gosh, it's going to be a really hard one to change. Oh my God. Incredibly great at it. Right. So. Yeah. You can always be surprised, but of course there are some marks that they need a little bit more uh, time to digest the change because of course it's not a simple change. And every single thing you need to do is to simply be there, be next to them, support them, and kind of like take them by hand. Kind of like when you're learning to ride a bike. Yeah. Somebody can just jump on it and go. And some other times, some other people that may need to have the, the tiny wheels a little bit longer. And that's perfectly yeah. fine. And I guess that's where they have you, right? You and your team. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That, that would be also interesting to hear now that uh, you're actually responsible. Um, I mean, you were obviously part of the digital team. Now you're heading yeah. the digital team. Uh, and uh, it could be interesting to hear your thoughts about how you build your team. Uh, mm -hmm. important. How do you imagine that you guys will work to actually make this vision about sample free selling and then yeah, utilizing digital tools and applying and researching AI stuff work. Like, yeah, what, what's your uh, thoughts and, and strategy about uh, uh, about your team? 
Yeah. Well, certainly you have to have somebody in your team that, first of all, you work well, very well as a unit. And, you know, you're all about teamwork rather than the individual. You know, team comes first, the, the individual comes second. That's like one of the key things there. But also to be somebody that likes to challenge the status quo. And most importantly, is able to show, I don't know if it's a, a common way of saying in other markets, but uh, in other countries, but in Italy, we say show the glass half full rather than half empty. Mm. You know, so always, because of course, as I said, it's not going to be an easy shift. And there are going to be a lot of challenges and the sales are might look at it as the glass half empty. Yeah. Instead, take those challenges and make it into a potential gain and an added value. So always have that ability to show the glass half full. It's something absolutely key. Um, and also just there to say, hey, I think this is wrong. We should go this direction instead of that other one. I think this is key. Not being afraid to speak up. Yeah, I, I was just about to say that. I, I don't know if that's because you're Italian, but uh, <laughs> the, the, the part where you're very humbly uh, state your very clear opinion uh, with charisma, it, it's, it's usually not an easy trait to do as a uh, mm -hmm. leader of the team, but um, it feels like uh, it's always been uh, quite easy for, for you to uh, challenge in a humble way, right? Yeah, I mean, as long as you're transparent and as long as you always try to bring to the table your ideas in a way that's constructive, because, you know, you have a why you're bringing this, you're not just bringing it just, just to say it. And then you can have a discussion about it because I can also have ideas that are completely bonkers. And I'm happy to have the feedback from, from my teammates, but also from other people in the organization, even also in the markets, you know, always have that. Yeah, humbleness, I guess you would call it, you know, to say, okay, I might have an idea, but it does not necessarily mean that I'm absolutely right all the time. Got it. So, so, so I mean, if we look at the skill set of people that will be needed to, to um, mm -hmm. carry out this strategy, uh, what are you uh, mainly looking for uh, from a digital team perspective? Yeah, a good person that besides, because of course, somebody that joins the digital team that it's obviously has a good digital knowledge, a good digital background. So that's kind of like a given, but the real added value is somebody that's able to train and empathize and communicate with right. our sales reps that are users that of course, some of them are very digital savvy, others are not, but yep. you always need to be able to translate all of the digital terminology, all of the technicalities and all these sort of things in a, something that it's very easy to transfer to the sales rep and at the same time, understand their feedback and then translate it back to the digital you know, flow that we have, you know, to improve the platforms and all the rest of it. Yep. This is key. Like you, you cannot succeed in my opinion, if you're trying to transform the way of working on people that are spread across primarily Europe, but also around the globe, okay. if not able to do this translation back and forth. So it's, it's not really enough to be aware of uh, the technologies, the tools and the AI stuff and so on. If you cannot communicate, translate, understand. Yeah. Do you think yeah. that's great? You can learn. Uh, if, if you just, um, hmm. or do you have to be somehow work as a salesperson within this industry to some extent? I don't think you need to be a salesperson, but you need to be a sort of sponge. You need to be able to get a lot of information and be able to actually assimilate it and be able to find, okay, this is actually what they really mean. Because of course, sometimes they, the sales of, they can give you feedback, but what they really mean is something else. And they are trying to explain it in the best way that they can, which is perfectly fine. And you need to take that feedback and apply it to the digital platform that you're using. And most importantly, you need to be able to define what is the nice to have and what is the need to have. Because sometimes you may fall into the rabbit hole. Oh, but this is, looks cool. This looks cool. This looks cool. Well, let's do it. But that's not necessarily a need to have. It's a nice to have, yeah. right? Um, but surely, I think, um, I feel like you can almost learn everything if you uh, put your effort into it. Uh, but I feel like also like you need to be somebody who's willing to listen. Yep. That's key. You know, you can be uh, the greatest person digitally or technically, but if you're not able to listen and understand what they're trying to feed you, they, you can be as great as you want technically, but you're not going to go very far in terms of the relationship and the trust that we talked about earlier. Yep. Um, and yeah. I've learned that myself actually there's a, uh, there's a funny thing when I was training, I can't remember which market, and I was there with, with Miha, you know him as well, a colleague, and then I was moved to another brand. And he stopped me and he said, Luca, yeah, but you're explaining it too technical. They're not going to understand it. It's like, all right, gotcha. 
and then actually flipping it into the sales way of talking. Yeah. Then that was like a huge eye opener for me. And that's how we've been doing the trainings ever since. I mean, I've seen you in action and it's really um, not an easy feat because I'm also doing a lot of demos and presentations myself. It's usually not that easy. I don't know how comfortable you would be with uh, us showing uh, uh, and commenting on the um, virtual try on uh, um, demo that we've made. So, so yeah. I have here the video and I think this, this yeah. really shows um, the yeah. skill of communicating and presenting a technology that is so new in, and, and this was done like over half a year ago, uh, mm -hmm. guys, and it's based on generative, uh, AI. Yeah. So to create a virtual try on models, just, uh, you know, based yeah. on what you said before about, uh, ability to showcase the same style in multiple configurations. Yeah. Um, so, so, um, I don't know if there is anything in particular you want to say as a background to it that we have mm -hmm. told or should I just go ahead and run the video and we can, um, I mean, as the background, of course, this was one of the solutions that we were trying to get into that, you know, okay, when we take away the samples, how do we give that same showroom experience? Because of course, right now you have the samples that fit very well. You take the t-shirt, take the pen, you put them like this, kind of like try it on yourself, kind of like you do when you go trying some styles before in, in the, in any store. Um, and of course, uh, we needed to find a solution or a test run of something that would mimic this this view. Of course, we have uh, also like all of our customers and sales reps, they tend to take styles and put them down on the floor, which we managed to uh, replicate that digitally. But it's a different thing to actually be able to do it on a, on an avatar. And we've gotten a lot of requests of this from many different markets, like spanning from, let's say, the ones that you would expect it from, like Denmark, like Sweden, also from the ones that, as I said, you wouldn't really necessarily expect it from like Greece. Right. They really requested like, this would be huge for us to go out and sell without samples. Amazing. You know, again, speaking of the, um, the help that we've gotten from the sales are being very much open to this new change. Right. Yep. And this was essentially the premise for trying to digitalize this action that everybody's doing in the, in the, in the showrooms with the, with the samples. Yes. Um, cool. Let's uh, take a look uh, and see how it, uh, just let me know anytime you want to comment and I can just pause. Yeah. In order to use the avatar, all you need to do is to simply get over in the SR and for instance, choose this t-shirt right here, as well as choosing the spent and I will see them being worn by the avatar. So now I can interact with the avatar. Of course, first thing I can do is to change the pose of the outfit. Because Actually, of course we... this, this is a key factor that I, I didn't think it was going to be that key. The different pose. I've had tons of questions about, okay, but is it only going to be from the front? The reason for this is actually that there's a lot of styles that have like, perhaps I remember there was a jacket that had, uh, it was uh, for dinosaurs, I think. And it, like the spurs of the dinosaur here on the side. And if you had the picture that we had earlier, from the front, you won't be able to see it. Exactly from here, you won't be able to see it. You would have to kind of like have the kid turn around. Of course, first thing I can this do is like, to... of course, like a very yeah. like tiny turn around, but the concept of it actually having different poses, I didn't think was going to be that crucial, but it actually is. Yeah, especially yeah. the backside, right? Like the prints of the backside can be completely different from the fronts. Um, and obviously taking pictures, uh, because I believe you tried on a mm -hmm. simpler way with Photoshop uh, to create this before, but, but I mean, the combination yeah. <laughs> would just <laughs> mind. Yeah. Like that's many. where we, we hope that the artificial intelligence can help us, you know, just click, click done. We're not, we haven't found the, yeah. the, uh, the solution yet, but my gosh, if we get there, wow, this can really go out very quickly. And I'm sure that the salesman would be super happy about it. Certainly. Let's uh, continue uh, listening on how well you also communicate. Uh, <laughs> to kind. The, uh, features. <laughs> the, speech, the pose of the outfit, because of course we know how the different angles are important to show to the customer before making a decision, but also it's important to show them the different color combinations. So here I can have the overview of the styles that I'm seeing. I can click on the t-shirt and go from white to yellow, as well as the pants going from dark sapphire to light gray melange. 
and you have a outfit with a different color variations. But I think what, what this shows already is the AI technology, because nowadays most people have yeah. seen these sort of try on technologies, right? Somewhere. But the fact that to try to put them into an application that is then used in a process is, I mean, we haven't really seen yeah. a lot of those examples yet. I would say none for fashion, really, uh, wholesale for sure. That it, like, how do you apply these technologies so that it makes sense yeah. from A yeah. to B? So of course, this process. is this would be like the uh, the ace up your sleeve of the sales rep when you're trying to convince the customers to actually buy into an outfit, a, a program, or whatever the case might be. Because of course, this gives them the reassurance, the confirmation that this would actually look nice for the end consumers from their stores. And of course, uh, yeah. when you have the avatars and the, of course we have the different color lines, so baby mini kits, right? So different styles they need to fit in a realistic way on the different avatars to give the most realistic view to the customer, to, con to the buyer, to convince that this will actually be impressive also when it will arrive in the stores for real to then be proposed to their own customers in the shops. Um, so this, it's not something that you have to do with every single set. It's something that you can do if needed, you know, because of course it's not that all the styles, oh yes, I'm going to buy everything. Uh, that would be a perfect world, but it is not the case. This, you would use it to convince about a set for the, for the customer to buy into. Exactly. But I think as you said, also, uh, you said, you said, so it, you know, you can show it how it looks like and you said nice. I think that was one of the key things that we want to, um, I guess you want to uh, evaluate here. Like to what extent does it matter that the products uh -huh. are photorealistic onto this or usually just have like yeah. a underwear and nothing else. Right. So you should be able to dress it with anything and it should look like it's in the right studio yeah. being photographed. Did you know how, how, how that's actually that a actually very is? tough question to answer. Um, of course, by default, you would say, yeah, it has to be as realistic as possible. But also in my experience, I've, I've seen some pack shots where I thought, oh, ouch, the quality of this photo is not really that great. Unfortunately, I think we, we ought to redo it again. And the sales were like, oh, I didn't see any problem with that. Well, why should we do it again? You know, because at the end of the day, it's always that quote unquote fight is not really a fight, but you know, between perhaps let's say I'm, I'm imagining a marketing team saying, okay, this picture is not really living up to the standards that we want. And the sales are like, oh, but this actually is helping me sell. And you need to find the right balance in between. Yep. And yeah, it's a very hard uh, um, question to answer, but of course the bottom line is that the more realistic it is, the better, but perhaps it does not have to be as realistic as we may think. But I think that's a very sober way of looking into it because uh, uh, obviously we want to uh, believe that the nicer the presentation is, the more yeah. convincing and persuading it will be, and most likely it is. But there must be like yeah. a, a tipping point where, it, I mean, from there on, maybe not that much. And and sometimes I see like these catalogs that being created for PowerPoints, and they look yeah. like I don't want to say the word. Uh, but it sells, it seems to do with the job. Um, so, so I think it's very good to be just aware of the fact that yes, we can bring in a lot of technology, but just to be aware it works yeah. with the PowerPoints yeah. that yeah. they have right now. So, so maybe it's important to um, consider like, uh, how can we make it quicker, faster, easier with introducing new technology? And then getting yeah, and absolutely. That way, I think really, right? that one of the lessons that I've learned in, in this year is in rolling out this transition is that, you know, sometimes you always try to have, you know, of course, I have uh, high uh, standards as everybody named it in bestseller. And sometimes you need to realize that maybe it's not the right thing to put out something that's absolutely state of the art perfect. It's actually perhaps fine to have it just a step below so that you can actually gain some feedback and figure out that maybe your state of the art was not necessarily the direction you wanted to go and you risk into going towards something that it's fundamentally more complicated than what it actually needs to be going back to the what looks cool what actually sells um and that was certainly a big learning in the process so yeah 
uh, I think you're absolutely right there, you know, uh, because if we manage to sell styles on paper, then, you know, we need to be a little bit realistic on what we can achieve for sure. Exactly. Uh, all right, let's uh, just uh, run the video yeah. a bit more. It's one minute left. So that was a very simple outfit. Although we know that we have some markets that they need a bit more complexity when they're creating the outfits. So we can add this. For instance, I can choose this t-shirt. I can choose this pant. And now I can also add this cardigan, which will be layered on top of the t-shirt mm -hmm. in the outfit. So now... I mean, th that technically is yeah. a challenge uh, to... to, to... <laughs> Um, that, that's not an obvious thing. I mean, there are so many challenges with this virtual try on thing. Uh, you know, everything from getting the prints and the yeah. text and, and the, you know, pre, um, patterns correct in no matter how you produce them and to do it on a scale, mm -hmm. ah, so hard. Yeah. If you go back a second, yeah. then actually it's, it's very Impressive. interesting that the, yeah, you see here. So a little bit above there was the t-shirt, then there was the pen and there was the cardigan, you know, that's kind of like how you layer it up. And if this technology is not exist, if we didn't have the digital showroom, what would happen in the showroom is exactly the same thing that you're seeing right now on the avatar right here. So we have the t-shirt, you have the pant, and then they would literally put the, the shirt of the, of the t-shirt inside the cardigan to make it look realistic and then take a picture of it and send it to the customer. This yeah. is how you would set it up in your shop. Yeah. And yeah, exactly. exactly. And it's Merchant. so technically complex to do this. And because I personally believe that mm. if we take away the cardigan, that's a easier approach, especially for those styles that are, let's say, you know, basic, you know, maybe just like color and photo print. Of course, when we have all of our prints, like in this particular case in the shorts, it, the complexity starts to increase, but it would be already a good starting point, getting back to what we were talking mm. about earlier. But then layering is something that the second we nail the first step, then the first question we're going to get from the sales rep is, okay, but how can I layer that on top of it? So it's something that definitely yep. is going to be needed uh, in this technology, in this, in this product. Yeah. Yep. All right. And I think now we're going to see you uh, do some sales <laughs> tricks and sales magic on top of the t-shirt in the outfit. So now I can actually, again, interact by changing the different poses on the avatar. And in this particular case, I'm going to save the outfit. Of course, now that I saved the outfit, we could get the question from the customer like, yeah, I like this one, but I would like to see it, how it fits with the different colors. So again, I can go around and for instance, change the cardigan and putting it in Dark Sapphire. And I can also change the shorts from Dark Sapphire to Chambray Blue, for instance. And now I have this new outfit, which I'm going to save again. Why am I saving the outfits? Well, because when I'm doing this, I can swipe up and have a look at the outfit that I'm currently looking at, but also the one that I saved earlier. This allows me to have the customer to make an informed decision about which outfit will work best in their shop. Let's say it was this one that we're looking at just now. What I can do now is to open the styles, hard them, which will add them to the basket. Okay. And I think this is where it really uh, sums up well what you've been talking about in terms of training, educating the markets. Like the, the way you present the features are not yeah. like click here to do this, click here to do that. It's more now you have two options. It's easier, and then you know um, the, the process of it uh, and what it enables you to, to exactly make it relatable, and trying to make I it guess, as right? easy to digest as possible. You know, like not really saying drag it up or down, uh, you know, downwards so that you can see the different set. No, 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 even just do it and, you know, I can go back here, you know, it's a small detail, but it's incredibly effective. That's amazing. Uh, Luca, we <laughs> spent already a little bit over one hour. It's been, uh, it's been really fast. Uh, the first episode of uh, Behind the Scenes, I have tremendously enjoyed talking to you and uh, I don't know how you felt, but um, so far, oh, yeah, it was absolutely really amazing. I, I love this topics and, you know, it's, it's always nice to kind of like try to discuss about it and try to push the vendors a little bit further. So yeah, thank you for having me. Great, great experience. Thank you Take for care. coming. Take care for now.